that's also scheduled to, scheduled to join us today. And and Greg, uh, you're not on the line. If you are, please let me know. And then finally, we have David Collins uh, from SEPTA who's going to be speaking to us as well. And David, I don't believe you're on the line either. Please speak up if you are. OK, and uh, Brad, I sent you a, a an a uh, an Outlook calendar invite. Did that work OK for you? There's there's Greg. Hi, Greg, how are you? Uh, yes, it did for me. This is Brad. OK, doing well. How are you today? Very good. Very good. So we're missing one speaker at the moment. Maybe we'll just wait another minute. OK, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. OK, so as I said, uh, so today uh, I should say welcome to the fourth in the series of cybersecurity webinars that the Cybersecurity Task Force is, is putting on. This, this webinar is actually the second part of our ransom, ransomware webinar. Part one, which we did a couple of weeks ago, was uh, as, we, as we termed it, the nuts and bolts of ransomware. And part two, which we're gonna do today, is, is what I would term real world experience. So we've uh, been fortunate enough to identify three agencies that are willing to kind of chat with us about an experience they had with ransomware. Um, and I guess the plan is that uh, each each speaker will speak for roughly about 15 minutes. We'll open up the floor to questions at that point after each speaker. Um, as usual, we're recording today's webinar. It'll be available in the cybersecurity forum. So if anybody uh, is unable to attend today or if you want to share it with somebody in your organization who couldn't attend, they can watch it at their convenience. So today, as I said, we have three speakers. We have Brad Alvaro, uh, who's the Information Technology Director with Valley Regional Transit in Idaho. We have Gregory Tower, who's the Transit Manager with the Connecticut Department of Transportation. And then finally, we have David Collins, who's the Senior Director of Information Technology with SEPTA. Um, so Brad, if you're, if you're ready, um, I'll turn it over to you. If you have anything you want to share uh, on screen, you know, feel free to go ahead and share if you're familiar with how to do that. If you need any help, yeah. the teams, I can walk you through that. Yeah, no, I, I don't really have much. But anyway, my name is Brad Alvaro. I'm the new IT director here at Valley Regional Transit in Idaho. And uh, I've only been here for four or five weeks. So uh, I just started um, and we've got a lot going on here. We got a big ERP system implementation going on. So that's why I wasn't able to attend the earlier um, Task Force meeting earlier this month, so I apologize for that. But uh, anyway, uh, we had an incident. Um, like I said, I was here only uh, five weeks now, starting my fifth week. And but we had an incident two years ago that um, I, I was not here, so I don't know the details. But I was able to talk with people that and IT staff that were here and to to better understand what happened. But before I go into that, let I also. Um, Prior to this job, I uh, I worked for the largest state agency for uh, Idaho, which is Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. I was the deputy director there, and we had a very huge presence of security. We had uh, full-time staff. We had three or four people that are dedicated to security. So I understand the importance of this subject. And, um, and then coming here, um, and I worked for the state government for 21 years, so I had a lot of experience with, uh, you know, meeting the the requirements from the, the federal agencies because with the data that we had at health and welfare, um, it, it's, you know, we, we had to put measures in place and 
policies and so forth. But and now now coming here to yeah, much smaller, we don't have the staff that we obviously had health and welfare, but here we're small. Uh, we do not have a dedicated uh, security person. We uh, the person we kind of share a lot of responsibilities, and I'm sure a lot of other smaller agencies uh, are in a similar boat. You know, we have multiple staff that does multiple types of responsibility. So having said that, that kind of lays the playground for, you know, what we have going on here. We don't have any uh, security individuals. So what happened, uh, my understanding is um, we had a security breach and it was caused from not patching the server and they were able to get in um, through a Microsoft um, through um, Exchange, I believe. And um, and some we, we caught it early. Uh, my understanding was very early in the morning. It's like 530 in the morning. So it was it started happening before anyone was really at work. But one of our IT uh, administrators noticed it and um, they just got in and he just noticed it and uh, he took the proper actions uh, to cut it off. So what he did um, is he immediately cut access um, to the internet. He did see these people starting to, they were aware of our, that we knew they were there and uh, they started um, covering up things. Um, they didn't start the encryption process yet on our servers, but um, anyway, we're very fortunate uh, <laughs> to not have anything really happen. I mean, they did get in, but they, they didn't cause really any damage. And so what we did is we we uh, shut down any access. We actually um, were able to, um, through our insurance for this type of incidents, they brought in um, some ex experts in um, cybersecurity breach and stuff of that nature. And they helped us out as far as identifying the areas and stuff like that. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, fortunately, it didn't cause us any damage really. They, they weren't able to get any data. They weren't able to encrypt servers, things of that nature. But, um, and then we're able to, we restored all of our servers. Uh, we had backups, we just did it, um, you know, just in case. But um, we were real fortunate that it happened that early in the morning because no one was on the systems, you know, updating files and things of that nature. So uh, lessons learned. Um, and as I mentioned, I was not here at the time, but um, one of the things I've been tasked with from my boss, the CEO, is to uh, look at IT assessment on a lot of different things, uh, one of which is cybersecurity. So uh, uh, my boss put me in contact with this group, and so um, I am a firm believer in cybersecurity. I mean, it's a huge thing, and we need to um, obviously put resources towards it, and we plan to do that. Right now, we've we've learned our lessons, and we've brought in a consultant the last year or two that helped us um, move forward with the security threat vulnerabilities and things of that nature. And and through my experience at health and welfare, we always did, you know, like penetration tests, pen tests, and stuff of that nature. So here, um, I'm going to start looking at um, those type of resources. And I don't know what this group can do. If you guys, I mean, I'm. I would assume that you're familiar with some services that are provided to do those type of pen tests and things of that nature. Um, we had that before where they would come in and and they wouldn't tell us. They would just we would have a contract with them. And so we, you know, we didn't know what day it was, but they would try to um, penetrate our network and do things and then they'd give us a report um, of that nature. But um, so moving forward, having said that, that's one of the things I'm uh, looking into right now um, is making sure that we have a good security stance here, uh, but we're real fortunate. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Okay. If not, I guess I'll turn it back to you. Um, yeah, uh, Brad, just to interject here, this is Rich Williams. Uh, well, I want to make sure people are aware that their mic likely is muted. Uh, so please uh, un unmute your mic before you uh, oh, try right. to say something. Good 
that and Brad, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. So this is uh, this is Sue Kopistecki. Um So my my question to you is you you had indicated that you were able to tell that they could tell that you were aware of them in your system. Like yeah. how long did and they started to cover things up? Like how long did they how long did they remain in your system knowing that you knew they were there? Um, from my understanding, not very long because the gentleman, our IT administrator, actually saw a web page that was open and he immediately knew he, he saw that as a um, cyber a ransomware type thing um, event happening. Uh, he's a pretty sh sharp guy and um, I'm not sure exactly how they were aware of that, of, of us being in there and seeing that. It's just that my person was able to detect that and it was like, in his words, he said they were cleaning up and um, so they weren't able to encrypt. So they started to do some things. He saw some processes running and then all of a sudden they were canceled, I guess is the best I can describe that. But I don't know. I don't have the details of that. I can certainly um, get those for you if you'd like, um, but it was just a real odd way of catching him. I guess we just, uh, you know, knock on wood, we got fortunate that he was able to log in from home and actually see that file. It was actually open. Um, so um, it was real fortunate. But I can dig in deeper if you like and find out exactly, you know, why, you know, he told me that he saw that he was in there and then they started backing out. I, I don't know the details of that. No, that's OK. I just it just it amazes me that um, <laughs> that they would spend any additional time if if you know if if you knew they were there, it would I, I would think they would be gone as quickly as possible. Yeah, but yeah, it's I do know that they, they did when he logged in there as the, the admin, he did see a window that was open and in there he immediate. So obviously they had that window open, I, I believe, and it, in that that window, it, it he, he realized it was, you know, not an attack. They were inside. So um, and then from that point, I, I don't know exactly what he did, but yeah, it was it was uh, <laughs> we were real fortunate. Uh, but. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't uh, explain that better. Um, oh, no, that's great. I, I appreciate it. Just scary stuff. <laughs> yeah. Brad, do you know at the time did uh, VRT have a uh, incident response plan in place? And did I, you I execute? Did they execute that when that I, that happened? No, I don't think they did because they. Um, um, I, I don't believe so. But since then, um, the process, the protocol they followed was pretty spot on, you know, they they knew what to do. They shut it down and then they immediately contacted our um, insurance, believe it or not, you know, for any damages and they had a process in place to bring in experts to help with that. So they were notified, which started, you know, the, the chain of getting experts in to assess it right away. So um, that was a good thing. But uh, to my knowledge, I don't know if we had any incident response plan in place at that time. OK. And did through the uh, forensics that occurred later by this by the firm that they that your insurance company brought in, were they able to identify who the folks were that were trying to penetrate your system? Um, not to my knowledge. OK. Those were things I, I mean, I could follow up. I, um, I I don't believe so. I I only have very little information regarding that because it it wasn't. Yeah, we were breached, but nothing really happened. With the exception with they started a, a start encrypting or whatever that process is. They started, um, so we caught them in time. We cut we we shut them off before they were actually able to do anything. So uh, that was a good thing and. Uh, so no no damage was done. It was just the breach. Gotcha. Uh, hey, uh, uh, Brad. 
Uh, this is Rich. Uh, did did in your former position at uh, the PHS, did, were you uh, in on any uh, near near misses or anything that was significant? Uh, um, we uh, no, we had very. I mean, we had a full security team. I mean, we you know we had um, you know we had over two hundred people in IT. So, and we had a, a security team of three to four, and we worked very closely with the feds. So uh, we had it pretty shut down. We were probably the most secure agency in the state. So we 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 didn't have any the, the things that that would occur is it would be things like this. Someone would copy data onto a, a DVD, and then they would leave it somewhere, right? Those type of things, and they didn't encrypt it. So we would get a call that somebody found, you know. A, a DVD somewhere that had our information on it, um, but fortunately, we we were never attacked. Um, we we were getting hit all the time. Let me put it this way: we were getting hit all the time by um, entities out of China. Uh, yeah. All the all the time. I mean, we got reports. Our the CISO was telling me that yeah, they're just trying to they're banging on the door because the type of information that we had. But um, we, we had great people with their very highly skills and we had a lot of resources. So uh, uh, fortunate. But yeah, we, we saw that a lot at health and wealth, welfare for what we did. Uh, people were constantly trying to get into us. Um, here is not the case. Um, uh, you know, we're much smaller. We don't have the type of data that uh, health and welfare has. So, um, but to answer your question, no, we didn't have anything really significant in health and welfare. Good, good. Brad, a uh, quick question. Um, with the VRT, do you know if at the time if um, multi-factor authentication was was something that was implemented? And if it was or if it wasn't, um, if that would have maybe thrown a roadblock in, in this case or would it not have mattered? I, I don't believe we had that in place. Okay. And like I said, I could, uh, if you, if someone wanted to collect some information or send me some of those questions, I can certainly find out. But I don't believe so. We didn't have that in place. There's a lot of things we didn't have in place. Um, and like I said, we're a very small IT shop. Um, but I can certainly follow up on any questions that I can't answer. Yeah, no, I appreciate the answer. I, I was just wondering if, if it would have mattered anyway, but um, it, that's interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so, Brad, have you, uh, in terms of your, you know, efforts to increase your uh, posture when it comes to cybersecurity, have you implemented an IRP yet, or are you in the process of doing that? Uh, same thing with MFA. Yes, we're in the process of that. We we do have a preliminary version. It's, there's not much to it. It's just, but uh, yeah, I'm. And thank you. I think it was Rich, I believe, who sent me that information on that. And uh, we are going to um, start moving down that path of putting one in. But we're in the mean. In the meantime, we have we, we contract out for um, for other services. And one of the things that the outside entity is able to help us with is um, batch management and uh, those type of things, and looking at pin testing and you know, all of those things. So uh, we're, we're moving on that, um, you know, as quickly as we can. But yeah, we don't have uh, several things in place yet. Okay. And I don't know if you told us, but how big is uh, VRT in terms of number of number of trips, for example, you provide daily or? Oh, of course you're going to ask me that. I'm the new <laughs> guy here. Ballpark. Uh, no, well, how many trips per day? Oh. Or number of so, vehicles? Do you, do you do both fixed route and paratransit? Or yeah, we do. Okay. And we're 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 consuming other cities in the we call it the Treasure Valley here: Boise, Meridian, Napa, Caldwell. And then then there's other smaller cities like Eagle, Cuna, uh, that surround us. So we're we're bringing all of those into our umbrella as we speak. So it's it's getting larger. 
Um, but as far as buses, regular buses, uh, I think we had not much. I think we have close to 70 and then we have, and I'm not sure if that includes the vans for the um, on demand. We have on demand um, services. We got a lot of services and I'm, I'm still coming up to speed on all these things. So I apologize if I can't give you accurate numbers on it, but uh, we're, we're not that large actually, but um, we do, we're the largest in Idaho here and we're growing uh, extremely fast. And so, so is our services. So we need, we just need to be prepared, you know, in IT for the technology that we need to provide and make sure that, you know, we have a secure foundation. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions for Brad? And I, I've been kind of multitasking here. David, David with uh, SEPTA has been having a hard time joining, so I've been trying to trying to walk him through that. But um, in the meantime, maybe we'll pass it over to to Gregory Tower with the Connecticut Department of Transportation. And Greg, like I said before, if you if you want to share something, feel free to go ahead and, and share something. Thank you, JD. Um, in fact, what you're sharing now is perfect, so I can point out that uh, I'm the only one here without the IT background <laughs> for today's presentation. Uh, so let's uh, just keep that in mind as we uh, walk through the chain of events. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to answer some of those uh, more technical questions, but um, I can say we I was here when we <clears throat> lived through this event in 2021. Um, the IT director for CT Transit um, is no longer with us, so he wasn't able to attend. Um, and a few other key people that were uh, at our CT Transit operation um, are no longer with us here. So by default, you're you're all stuck with me. Um, I guess I'll start off with a quick overview of just the Department of Transportation in Connecticut and our relationship um, with h and uh, which is the organization that had the um, ransomware attack. So h &S is the subsidiary of our um, operating uh, uh, provider, uh, RITP Dev. And um, basically, uh, we it's a service provided by the, the DOT, the Connecticut DOT. It um, can be viewed as a division, but it's uh, the subsidiary company of RITP Dev, our service provider, thus all their um, you know procurements and everything's done uh, through the subsidiary company, uh, separate from um, the Connecticut DOT. So we we operate separate um, emails, technology, procurement software, pretty much operate uh, completely separate of of one another. Um, in 2001, uh, September 2001. Uh, Right before Labor Day weekend, which I'm told that's a, a typical time that these things can happen is is right before a holiday weekend. Um, try to catch you while you're, you know, I guess co coasting out on the uh, the long weekend, perhaps. Um, you know, we were alerted through uh, our service provider H and S that uh, their email was down. So, um, you know, I I hear David and Sept is having some trouble logging on. That's kind of a you know, we we jokingly around here when you're having technology issues, it's you think that's bad uh, when you have a ransomware attack. Uh, we we literally got kicked back to the Stone Ages in a matter of minutes. Um, so next time you're trying to struggle logging into your Teams meeting or Zoom meeting, it's uh, it's far worse than that. Um, within, you know, initially we really didn't know what was going on. We thought it was just a um, you know, a glitch in the system, um, but then it became clear as all of our systems went offline that uh, something something was happening. Um, so um, we we all administrative services were really halted. Uh, we didn't have Internet. We didn't have uh, our network was down. Uh, servers were down. Landlines were down. Um, everything was basically inoperable. Uh, the 
you know, the bad actor, as you will, uh, made themselves known, um, you know, and in, engaged with uh, the team on the ground there. Um, we quickly began to work with the service provider, our, uh, you know, the, the leadership team at HS, the service provider uh, at, a, at a corporate level. Um, we notified authorities, um, you know, including the FBI. We were also alerted that a few other uh, agencies in the area fell victim to similar ransomware um, that same weekend. Um, and we engaged with a consultant. Um, we engaged with uh, a, a consultant to, to help us through this, um, this issue. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, the ransomware was paid. Um, and what we understand it to be was, you know, they were hackers uh, who claimed to be, um, you know, Russian hack hackers uh, that were, you know, out to to get ransomware. Um, so, uh, I guess going forward, you know, there's a lot that we learned through this, um, you know, in terms of improving our cybersecurity um, to prevent something from happening in the future. Um, I would say, you know, additional staff is key, you know, it's, uh, you know, having staff on hand, we, we certainly, you know, changed our staffing structure, um, you know, moving more programs, you know, to the cloud, I think as transit agencies, sometimes, you know, it's a good time for transit now with technology on the being on the forefront. So updating our systems, moving more things to the, the cloud uh, based um, storage and replacing legacy homegrown systems that I'm sure we all have or had at some point. Um, backing up things daily. <laughs> um, we we lost a lot of important historical documents. Um, so things you're saving to your desktops or things you're just, uh, you know, don't have backed up on the cloud um, or, or elsewhere. You know, imagine if you were had intact today, you know, all that is lost. Um, so that's something we've been more diligent about. Um, and then looking for, uh, I think you asked for some other lessons. They're so looking for more uh, uh, services to provide, uh, you know, testing. Um, you know, we're looking at doing a technology audit, you know, peer audits, uh, things like that, um, you know, and other services that that test your, your vulnerability and your, uh, your system. So uh, those are some of the, the lessons learned uh, we had coming coming out of that. Um, any, uh, you know, any other questions that I guess I'll turn it over to the group for questions. Uh, Greg, you, you, you mentioned that the ransom was paid. Yes, it, okay. it was. Do you mind sharing how much that cost? You know, to be honest, I don't have the uh, the ballpark, uh, the number at ballpark. I believe it was a couple hundred thousand. Okay, but they did they uh, at least attempt to make good on restoring your information? I know you said some of the stuff was still lost, but did they kind yeah. of like hold true to the, the bargain per se? Um, Certain documents were never recovered. Um, the systems did were able to come back on. Uh, we switched payroll systems during the uh, during the uh, attack. We switched a lot. We actually switched a lot of stuff during the attack. So when some of those systems came back on, we, you know, uh, fool me once, right? You know, fool me twice. Shame on shame on me. So we really didn't. You know, phone lines. I think we we used again, but some of the stuff we abandoned. Um, and then to make good on some of the, the the threats, to your points, we we didn't recover a lot of the the data, the documents. Um, is is what I remember to be uh, be be one of the takeaways from that. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Megan. Did they give you any indication why they targeted your agency? Um, no, I, I think what we've what we learned is, you know, these bad actors, you know, again, target. You know, transit agencies uh, targeted 
transit agencies in the area. I think we were one of three during that time period. Um, you know, unsuspecting probably um, old legacy systems, easy. Um, these are kind of just I don't want to say guesses, but things that were came out of what our consultant said to, um, you know, before the holiday weekend is a real thing, you know, before when staff's going to be lean, you know, people aren't going to be are, are on cruise control. Also, when you're negotiating with them through your holiday weekend, it's not ideal, right? <laughs> so um, things like that uh, is what we we heard through the consultant. This is Sue. Um, so how long how long did the actual attack last? Um, I want to. Yeah, so I want to say how long were we without? So operationally, we were able to keep running um, throughout the attack. So we, you know, as I pointed out in the beginning, you know, our CT Transit brand goes beyond just what was attacked. You know, H&S was the subsidiary that was attacked, but we have private providers also providing service. We have our own CT rides call center. So we migrated customer you know, inquiries to CT rides. Um, you know, we were able to use hotspots for internet for staff. We were able to, you know, our contractor was able to utilize their, you know, first, you know, their corporate emails versus C the CT transit emails. So I guess to answer your question, um, you know, we kept things running, um, you know, payroll, things of that nature. Once we finally set the deal, um, you know, I, I would say it was a, a month, if not a little more, um, you know, when we decided, hey, some of these systems we've been living out, living without for the last few weeks, you know, we what cost reward proposition, you know, of, of getting some of these things back. Um, so it was uh, it wasn't more than, you know, several weeks, I would say, um, if that makes sense. But we still yeah. feel we still feel the ramifications of some of the losses. And again, not to be a broken record, but mainly with the historical data or you know, things that were lost, you know, whether it's going through a triennial review and you're looking for things and they just you don't have them. Um that that is still felt today. But in terms of in terms of turning things back on, like the phone systems and and whatnot, um, you know, we were able to work with our contractor, even help free up some stuff. But um, basically, it was several weeks. Interesting. Thank you. Um, also, one other question: You mentioned um, technology audits. Are you doing them now? Um, we are in the process of we we gone through two presentations of uh, through our provider of having a, a technology audit. So we're in the process of doing one. Thank you. Hey, uh, I, I, got, I have a question. After paying the ransom, was there any offer to send any kind of decryption keys or tools or anything like that? Or were you pretty much just hung out to dry? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Fair. So thank you. So, so after you paid the ransom, you really got nothing in return for it. Is that right? Um, again, I think my role in this was more with the operations side of things. Um, we were, again, running service really un unknown to the public facing. Um, so everything that was kind of happening in terms of the negotiations was was, was with the consultant. And um, you know, DOT and H and S leadership. Um, so I don't know. I can't say for certain what you know if they what was given back or um, things did come back online, but and we were able to start using things again. But it, um, you know, I, I don't know how it was formally done. To be honest with you, was was it uh, primarily 
was the aim of paying the ransom primarily to get your data back? Was it also to prevent them from sharing sensitive information that they might have obtained? Yes, I would say that's fair. Yeah, Gregory, this this is Rich Williams. How uh, how was the attitude of the the H and S and and uh, DOT employees having to get through this? Were they uh, uh, are, are did they become more security conscious? Did they were they more willing to uh, uh, go to the trouble of uh, handling things better? It's a it's a great question. Um, you know, you hope your memory isn't short term. I think this was, you know, you this was a good reminder asking to be part of this webinar today. Um, you, you quickly moved to the next issue in line a, a few years later. Um, so I think just continued training and learning is always a good good uh, process for anything you're trying to improve or implement. So to answer your question in short, I think. In the short term, absolutely. Even the DOT being, you know, we didn't experience or live through it. We we had zero effect to any of our systems, um, but we certainly changed, you know, our own internal practices and shared it with all the transit districts in the state. Um, you know, took a deeper dive in what all the transit districts were doing uh, for for security and cybersecurity. Um, you know, you just want to stay on top of it. We, you know, we, we, I would say there, <laughs> I think the staff that was directly affected certainly still, you know, has a reminder and is, is open to the, the cybersecurity, uh, being more cybersecurity conscious. That's, that's good to hear too. And I, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you could kind of push down this lesson on, on the, uh, well, the, the units throughout the state and have them learn too. Yeah, I think, you know, in during the, you know, the incident triage of when this was happening and communicating to others in the state, because you don't know what the scope of the attack is, you know, or how quickly it can be spread to some of the other transit districts via you know, email or whatever the case may be. So, you know, making sure you have quick means of communicating to others is is a good takeaway too um in the event you have to you know not rely on email um to to communicate yeah. to your your peers in the state um so yeah that's a good point your 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 right hand is pretty much cut off there yeah we were we were fortunate in the way we operate being that the DOT is very closely linked with CT Transit, but not directly tied, um, meaning, you know, we were able to take on a lot of the, you know, some of those, you know, for example, our, you know, the call, shifting the calls for the customer and, um, you know, notifying other transit districts and keeping things moving quickly uh, was, was key. Good, good. Two, two more quick questions for you. Greg, you might not know the answer to these questions, but often you hear that the ransom is really a minimal part of the cost to an organization that is victim to ransomware, just in terms of the other expenses, bring consultants in or types of steps you have to take to recover from it. Is that was that your experience here? Do you think the ransom represented a relatively small fraction of the overall cost that it occurred? Yeah, I think someone who stated earlier, in my opinion, hit the nail on the head with, you know, protecting the the potential information loss or or uh, you know um, leak of of our state of the staff. You know, I think. You know, it's tough to put a value on just that, and also just getting all of our potential data back. So I, I would, I would say yes to that. And the other, the only other question I have was, um, so the Department of Treasury has a list that's maintained by an organization within Treasury called OFAC, which is a list of 
entities that the uh, U.S. government has sanctions against that they prohibit ransom payments to. Did you do you know if they interacted with uh, anyone in Treasury to ensure that whoever the ransom was being paid to didn't ultimately wind up going to a sanctioned entity? I'm sure we we had most federal and um, you know state law enforcement and you know FBI was involved and um, you know F, F, uh, FTA every we, there was a a long list of folks who were notified and communicated with during the attack. And any other questions for Greg? Very interesting, very informative. Um, so, David, you were able to join us. I apologize for difficulty you might have had there. Um, so, David, David Collins is the Senior Director of Information Technology with SEPTA. And uh, David, I'll turn it over to you. If you want to share anything, feel free to do that. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. SEPTA uh, suffered a cyber incident in August of 2020. And our first indication of that was calls to the help desk for software not running that happened almost simultaneously with a, a huge number of um, antivirus alerts being triggered and coming in. So at that point, we knew that, that something had happened and, and began investigating it. What we didn't know at the time and subsequently found out was that Threat actors had been in our network for several weeks at least poking around before they they did something so overt that it began to actually trigger alerts and and um, behavior that was noticeable to the users. So we we began to respond and try to isolate what was happening and and trace it back to to the source and clean it up. Un unfortunately, and hindsight is always 2020, but we prioritize keeping systems up and running rather than um, rather than cutting off the threat actors. So they they still had access to their C2, and they were still able to to maintain their presence in our network while we were investigating and and trying to remediate this. So they they were able to escalate their access to domain admin level. They got a hold of credentials. They they had access to to our entire server infrastructure, and after they realized that we were onto them, um, maybe about a day, a day and a half later, they began deploying ransomware. And our first indication of that was people calling in saying that they had ransom notes and they couldn't open their files. And at that point, we were we were basically you know those those systems were were dead in the water they they got access to our virtualization infrastructure and they encrypted the actual vm files on the hypervisor so so our servers were encrypted um not not even at the os level they they encrypted the files on the hypervisors as well as desktops getting their files encrypted and yeah, so so that that whole situation was was bad. We we lost access to um, all all the systems that that run our financials. Um, a lot of the systems that that assisted with our operations, vehicle location tracking, communications. We were still able to run service, and we our revenue system wasn't impacted, so we were still able to collect fares. So fortunately, from a an operational standpoint, we were still able to to operate our service, but a lot of the the things that that people rely on the the app that shows um, schedules and real time information, the signs in the stations, all of that was offline. Um, so we, it, you know, the the group that that hit us was the Maze Ransomware Gang, which is has since retired i think i think they they ceased operation six months after after they hit us and it, it was a long cleanup process we we ended up um getting help from a couple different groups so so when it happened we um yeah, we know we notified the city we notified the fbi 
and we brought in a couple consulting uh, groups because we we needed resources to help us respond to this and and recover quickly. So we brought in a, an outside cybersecurity firm to to help with some of it, and we brought in Microsoft Consulting because we have such a large Microsoft footprint to help us um, remediate this, e evict the threat actors, begin recovering. Um, one of the things they unfortunately did was they deleted our backups um, prior to deploying the ransomware. So that made some of the recovery difficult. They, they didn't get all the backups, fortunately. So we didn't lose any information. They, they, uh, they missed some of the, the immutable stuff that we had um, in our SAN, but they, they got our, our sort of offline backup system. And they also didn't get our mainframe, which, which ran some of our, our financial and HR info systems. So that all stayed up. Um, we, we, we had to, to sort of jury rig a system to, to get payroll to the bank, um, but we were able to do that and that wasn't affected. Um, so there, there were, there were some some things that, that fortunately withstood withstood the attack. We we kind of learned a lot of hard lessons out of this. Um, I think as as an organization, the the IT department was not sufficiently funded and didn't have the the appropriate staff to to maintain and and secure some of these systems. So this this very clearly underscored that message and and a lot of things that. That were previously not possible were were made possible. Um, I think also people learned a lesson about taking security processes and and procedures and risks more seriously. Um, a, a lot of times there were things that that were recommended that were overridden by by management um, that that people just didn't want to do. They they were seen as too difficult, and and now. We don't get as much pushback about those things when when we talk about risk or we talk about we need to we need to institute these procedures or we need to spend this money to to reduce this risk. People take that a lot more. Oops, sorry, um, uh, people take that a, a lot more seriously. Yes, absolutely. We also learned um, a, a lot of lessons around privileged access management, about multi-factor authentication, as well as putting processes in place to make sure human error doesn't let something slip through. Um, you know, there there were a lot of exceptions. There was a lot of stuff that was maybe done out of expediency that that probably shouldn't have been done, and we got a lot more um, disciplined and a lot more structured about. Uh, about how we deal with risk and how we deal with cybersecurity procedures. So uh, I think my biggest advice is do do the low hanging things that, that you know you should be doing, um, e even if they're difficult. Multi-factor authentication everywhere, real privilege management, especially if you have Active Directory. Uh, Microsoft has a lot of good guidelines, uh, as does CISA about how to structure Active Directory so that people can't escalate privileges within it. Um, yeah, I think I think those are are kind of the main the main things that happened to us and the main points we learned out of it. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, David, did did you uh, not have MFA when this happened? We didn't in a lot of circumstances. We we had some MFA on the stuff that was internet accessible, but it wasn't full coverage. There were definitely um, systems you could log into that did not require MFA um, that were public facing on the internet. And, and that's something that we have completely eliminated uh, during the recovery. Um, it it took us at least a year and a half to get all of our systems back. Um, obviously, the the critical operational systems were were back within about three weeks, but it was it was a year and a half before everything was finally fully recovered. Do Do you know how uh, they got in, and if MFA, if it was fully implemented, might have uh, 
at least thrown up a roadblock or stopped it? We never found out. None of the forensics that was done found the initial point of entry. We we had a couple suspicions. Um, there were there were some unpatched servers that had vulnerabilities that were public facing on the internet. So that's kind of my personal suspicion about how they got in, but we never found any actual definitive proof. Thank you. Aside from MFA, what would you say were your biggest changes um, after this attack? Um, I would say the the privilege access management was a a fairly large change. We we didn't have good separation of admin and non admin accounts. We didn't have uh, privilege access workstations that were that were isolated to do our admin work. We we really just used the same, um, you know, the same account and and computer to say check your email as well as doing domain admin work. Um, and, and since then, we've really, really strictly followed a lot of the, the guidance from, um, you know, especially from Microsoft when it comes to Active Directory privileged access management. Um, that, that's been a fairly large change, as well as we didn't have a lot of, um, we didn't, we did not have a SIM. Um, uh, we, we didn't have a SOC prior to the attack. Um, we had been asking for funding for that for probably four years, and it kept getting denied. Um, and, and since the attack, we've we've contracted with a company to do uh, to to do twenty four seven you know SOC monitoring for us. We've implemented a SIM. We've really increased our our logging capabilities as well as um, we, we got a full uh, endpoint detection and response platform instead of just a, an antivirus system. So we've really increased our, our telemetry and visibility to be able to spot um, uh, attacks or anomalous behaviors. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I, I saw a question in the chat about MFA. So if an employee doesn't have a company phone, what we have done for that for MFA, we got, um, yeah, we actually got fobs. We got YubiKeys um, that we gave to employees. Because because one thing we did um, run into was in our control center, there are rules about them not being allowed to check their phones while they're in the control center, because um, that's been a, a big problem in the past. So to, to do MFA there, we got them um, YubiKey devices, which are our, um, they're FIDO2 tokens that can be used to um, to log in securely, um, and they they meet the MFA requirement. And we've actually been rolling that out. Um, we've been distributing tablets to our our rail conductors, um, and there's the same issue there. They can't they can't have phone electronic devices while they're they're working, so they're they're using the same thing, um, and that's that's worked out really well. David, this is. Go ahead, Sue. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Can you explain what a SIM is? Oh yeah, security. Um, the I guess security incident and event management. Um, I'm probably wrong about what the I is. Um, but it's a a central location where you send all of your logs. Um, so there's there's a couple different companies that um, that that make SIM products, but it's essentially you take all of your, your sources of logging information. So server logs, firewall logs, um, even, even um, logs from like an, an endpoint detection response platform um, and, and anything that can really forward syslogs. So any network devices, um, our SAN, pretty much anything, um, that, you know, any piece of technology we implemented, that's kind of, the, that's kind of my first question is, you know, what logging information can we get out of it and how can we get it out? Um, so we send all of that and it gets recorded in the SIM. And then the software, um, you know, has detection rules that it that it has baked in, as well as we we get indicator of compromise feeds and threat feeds from various places like the um, the surface transportation ISAC publishes them. The the MS ISAC, uh, the the multi-state ISAC, 
will publish indicators of compromise. So all of that gets loaded in and the SIM looks for those kinds of activities, um, as well as our, our cybersecurity team and our, our consultants from the SOC are also um, doing you know, what's called threat hunting. Um, so they'll do proactive searches when, when different um, you know, write-ups will come out about, about different attacker techniques or different groups. They'll do searches for stuff like IP addresses, file hashes, um, techniques. So it's a, it's a way of centralizing all of your information in, in a searchable place that you can apply rules to that, that will alert you if there's any anomalous activity or anything that matches sort of a, a, an existing threat pattern that's, that's known. Thank you so much. And David, just curious, um, so you have a cybersecurity team. I heard you mention that. Do you have an incident response plan and do you conduct periodic tabletop exercises with it? Yeah, so that's something that um, we've been putting a lot of work into um, since the breach. Um, we, we redid our, our IR plan from the ground up. Um, we've done a couple tabletops of our own, but we were actually in the process of um, bringing in a company that specializes in tabletops to start running them for us um, to get kind of a better, um, more independent, you know, uh, regular cadence to them, as well as sort of an outside person to help run it, keep the whole process honest, um, you know, and, and getting a set of outside eyes to come in and say, okay, we're, we're going to throw this this sort of scenario at you based on what's happening out in the world and then sort of look at your response and, and, and you know, and tell us, you know, what we could do to improve it um, and, and help us find flaws, you know, in our current processes. So that, that's that been something that we put a lot more focus on because um, we, we really didn't have good processes to, to respond when, when the incident happened. Um, and, you know, trying to come up with that while people are panicking and while, while, you know, a lot of, a lot of high level people in the organization want answers right now, um, is, is, is not a, a good place to be. Um, but yeah, having, having the, the IR plan well tested, well known and documented beforehand, um, is, is something I wish I had then. It, it's tough to find time on people's schedules because people tend to, you know, well, we, we can do, you know, we can always deal with that later. You know, it's not pressing, but we're, it's, it's something that, that, that we've kind of learned the hard way. Like you, you have to make time for it. it. Used to be a fatality before they put a stop sign in, right? Right. Yeah. Un unfortunately, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there, there were a few things that, that were like that after the, the incident where it was like, well, you know, we we should have done this before, and and we knew that. But that in order to get the actual thing to materialize, something bad had to happen. Any other questions for David or Greg or Brett? Okay, well, I would just like to one more time thank thank our three speakers today. I think it was very valuable listening listening to your experience, and uh, really really appreciate it. So, like to thank all those that, that attended today. So, if there's nothing else, I uh, won't hold you up. It's a little past two, but once again, thank you very much, Brad and Greg and David. We really appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. Sure, absolutely. Happy to help. Likewise. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Sorry you had to go through this. Thank you. Uh... Thank you.